And let's stand to our feet this evening. Make it war in the heavenlies. Put your hands together. Make it war in the heavenlies. Tearing down principalities. Standing firm in Jesus' victory. Make it war. Make it war in the heavenlies. Casting down every high thing that exalts itself against the knowledge of God. Make it war. Make it war in the heavenly, tearing down principality, standing firm in Jesus' victory. Make it war, make it war in the heavenly, casting down every high thing that exalts itself against the knowledge of God. He's the rising, he's the rising, the rising in our midst. The mighty man of war, moving battles on earth, welding a two-edged sword. He is conquering all our enemies. He's the under our feet. So.
praise. God, we worship you. God, move in your place tonight. Pour out your spirit, God. I give you praise tonight because you deserve it. I give you praise for what you've done. I give you praise for you deserve it. I give you praise for what you've done. I give you praise for you are able. I give you praise till I overcome. I give you praise when the sun is shining. I give you praise in the dark of night. I give you praise when the battle rages. I give you praise till it works out right. Ooh. Shout of a king among us. God lives here in our praise. Shout of a king. King among us, God lives here in our praise. The shout of a king among us, praise him, praise him, praise him in everything. Oh, lift your voice, I give you praise, for you deserve it, oh Lord. I give you praise, for you deserve it. I give you praise, for what you've done. I give you praise. The sun is shining. I give you praise to the dark of night. I give you praise when the battle rages. I give you praise till it works out right. Oh, oh, child of a king among us, God lives here in our faith. Child, child of a king among us, praise him. your church, Lord, move in this place. Hallelujah. Lifting your hands in worship. Amen. I surrender it all. Hallelujah. Lifting your voice. I, here I am.
Uh, amen for a number of needs. 
uh, very important needs we want to go together for as uh, many people here you may have heard the passing of our dear founder of our fellowship pastor Wayman Mitchell uh, let's pray for the Mitchell family in this time of loss uh, also for the passing of another minister of God pastor uh, Glenn Cluck uh, that God's hand be upon the Cluck family uh, in this time of loss uh, let's pray amen for our nation let's pray for uh, our uh, governing officials let's pray for our pastor amen pastor Saavedra uh, and sister Janelle uh, let's keep each other in prayer uh, amen tonight let's uh, many needs that are uh, out before God as you can see uh, on the list here behind me lift up each one of these let's pray for pastor Greg Mitchell amen as he is now uh, amen uh, uh, assuming the role of the leader of our fellowship that God's hand would be upon him Amen. This time, uh, direction, guidance. Uh, amen. Let's pray for what God is going to do in the future. I know you've got needs on your heart. You can make that known by lifting your hand. Amen. We want to join with you in this hour. Maybe you're watching via live stream. We want to join with you as well, wherever you are, praying for our sister Judith Livano for healing on her body. Uh, Linda. Amen. Our sister Linda. And of course, uh, Amen. Our brother Jenkins, healing on his body. We're going to go before God in prayer. Amen. Let's go before heaven. Father, we ask for every need, comfort right now. God, for the Mitchell family, Lord, I pray, Lord, that you would move and comfort on the Cluck family. God, in this time of loss, I pray direction, guidance. God, I pray your hand of comfort. God, I pray on our sister Donna Cluck. Lord, that your hand would be with her, Jesse. And angel, God, John and Crystal, God, your hand upon them. We pray, God, Lord, that you would move on every need that is brought before you in this urgent hour. We pray, God, tonight, Lord, in confidence that you can hear what we are saying. We pray healing on every sick body. We pray, God, comfort on every morning soul. We pray even now, God. Your hand upon our fellowship, your hand upon every church, every pastor, every pastor's wife, every evangelist, every missionary, every congregant, every person in ministry. Father, in this time we come to you in confidence. God, we pray and we are in anticipation for what is to come. We ask God even now on our city, our governing officials, Lord, that your hand would be outstretched. Lord, even now guiding us, directing us. Lord, I pray bringing clarity, understanding. We bind every assault from hell that would work against your church for it will not prevail we come Lord we thank you we give you praise and glory and we rejoice Lord in the Lamb of God Jesus Christ who has given us life and that more abundantly and father we give you glory tonight that we can assemble together in unity in unison with one heart one mind and one accord we give you praise and glory for your name forevermore in the name of Jesus let's give God praise tonight take your seats this evening. Uh, first off, we'd like to welcome everybody to the Door Christian Fellowship, where Jesus Christ is still changing lives. Amen. We'd also like to uh, welcome those that are tuning into the live stream. Thank you for joining us this evening. We do appreciate you. Uh, don't forget all the events we do have coming up. So October 30th and the 31st will be the grand opening of the theater part of the venue. Amen. We will be putting on Beauty and the Beast, so be ready for that. Uh, and then also, uh, for that, we are uh, directly afterwards, we're going to be um, passing out candy for a, a tr uh, Be Our Guest Trunk or Treat. And so we are asking that if you um, could please get uh, every family two bags, big bags of candy per family uh, by October 28th, Wednesday, October 28th. That would be a tremendous blessing for that so we could get that. We also will be putting that on uh, November 28th. And as well as December 19th for Christmas with the Beauty and the Beast. So keep those in mind. And then also for those involved, there will be practice uh, for that play here at the church on Tuesday at 6.30. So keep that in mind as well. And then also coming up this Friday, uh, we will be having Accelerate for the teens at the venue. It will be opening up at 6.30 this week. The coffee shop will be open for half an hour prior. So it will open up at 6.30 at the venue that will be open um, and the coffee can uh, is purchase purchasable via the cash app or cash if you'd like to send your teens with cash for that that would be a blessing 
And then also uh, there's going to be a young adults Bible study this Friday at Evangelist Adrian's house. Uh, that will be at 8 o'clock. And rem uh, so keep that in mind. Then also this Friday there's a new converts Bible study. It will be Friday at 6.30 at Brother Lewis's house. Um, if you need the address for that, you can get with Brother Lewis or myself. But the address for that is 46. 01 14th Street, so keep that in mind as well. And then this Saturday, uh, we will be having a concert starting at 7 o'clock at the venue. Amen. And then the coffee house will be open 6 o'clock for that, so keep that in mind. And then don't forget for those that are tuning in the live stream, the options for giving. Uh, you can give through the Cash App. Remember to notate where those funds are going, or you can mail that into the P.O. Box, P.O. Box 19274, zip code 79114. You can bring that to morning prayer on the weekdays from 7 to 9 every morning. And that's all the announcements I have this evening. Let's give God a clap offering as Pastor comes. Praise God. As we get ready to give, amen, I encourage you to be right with God in your giving, amen. In the book of Luke chapter 18 is a story about a widow, amen, where Jesus uses her as an example of how just God really is. And the, the Bible says this, then Jesus spoke the parable of them, that men always ought to pray and not lose heart, saying there was in a certain city a judge who did not fear God nor regard men. Nor there was a, uh, now there was a widow in that city, and she came to him saying, Get justice for me from my adversary. And he would not for a while, but afterward he said within himself, Though I do not fear God nor regard men, yet because this widow troubles me, I will avenge her, lest by her continual coming she weary me. Then the Lord said, Hear what the unjust judge said. And shall God not avenge his own elect who cry out day and night to him, though he hears long with them? I tell you that he will avenge them speedily. Nevertheless, when the Son of Man comes, will he really find faith on the earth? The story here tonight that Jesus uses is a story about justice, but it's a lesson about persistence. Can you say amen? This widow is there. A widow is one who had lost a husband. And when she lost her husband, that is her entire identity. That is everything in life. She was uh, more than likely going to, uh, amen, have to rely on the community for support. Uh, according to the word of God, that genuine, true widows uh, would have to do. And Jesus uses her as an example of God's speedily judgment. His speed, uh, amen, uh, judgment. And he says that this is a woman who goes to a judge who does not fear God, nor does he fear man. So this is a very unrighteous judge. It's a very, amen, shrewd judge. And Jesus says, with her persistence and her faith, got an answer from a judge that was not likely to answer. He connects the story, amen, with our Father in heaven. How many know that our Father is a judge but he is also a good judge. Can you say amen? And he says, if this unruly, this unrighteous, this shrewd judge on earth responded to a persistent widow who believed, how much more your father respond to you, who is not shrewd, who is not unrighteous. So he says, here is the parallel. That when we come into the house of God with a need and persistence combined with faith, that God stands ready to speedily respond. Can you say amen? When we come with offering, amen, this is a need and persistence. There are people here you've been giving for years, for as long as you've been saved, tithing and giving offering. And there are moments where you say, God, I need a miracle. God, I need you to help me. Amen. Jesus is saying, listen, God is standing ready to respond speedily on your behalf. Number one, God is a God of justice. Persistence combined with faith draws an immediate response from on high. And tonight, as we are in the house of God with our offerings, with our tithes, this is a declaration of our faith in action. Faith and works. Can you say amen? It's one thing to say, I believe, but it's another thing to say, I believe, therefore I am. And this is what the text is about. is a woman who says, I believe I can get justice, and because of this, I'm going to persist. I encourage you here tonight, as our ushers begin to make their way, amen, with your offering, whatever it is, in the envelope. And it's going to be between you and God. 
To say, God, I need a miracle. I give because I'm grateful, but I'm going to be persistent in prayer. I'm going to lay hands on my check right now. I'm going to lay hands on my offering that I'm going to give to you right now because I'm grateful, but God, in all reality, I need a miracle. This is, amen, a sacrificial offering. This is an offering that, amen, is going to hurt my pocketbook. And God, I'm going to be as persistent on this, as this window, and I'm going to put my hand on this offering, and I'm going to command the heavens to be open because you said we can do that. I know that that's what David did when he gave. He, put his hand, he prayed for his offering, and God multiplied to him. That's biblical, folks. That when you give in your offering, that you lay hands and say, God, this is my free will offering. And I believe you're going to honor that. My tithe, this tithe is yours. And you lay hands on that. And Jesus says, how much more your father in heaven that he won't respond speedily. Some of you need a speed response from God. A rapid response. Can you say amen? A rapid refund. <laughs> Some of y'all pay 700 bucks a year to get a rapid refund. Amen. This is something that God says, I am willing to rapidly refund, amen, in response. I wonder how many in faith right now, as your heads are bowed and eyes are closed, as this woman who had absolutely nothing to lose, her husband had passed. She's a widow. She's completely dependent and codependent on society right now. But God says, an earthly unjust judge moved for her because she persisted, she believed, and she got an answer. Jesus is saying, listen, God is better than that judge. And I wonder how many here this evening would have put this to the test in the realms of giving. Father, we pray for every offering, for every gift, God, that is going to be given tonight in this offering plate. It is an opportunity, God, to be in your presence. An opportunity, God, to be in the mix tonight, in your heaven to be open. We ask, God, even tonight that you would open up the windows of heaven upon every liberal soul. Make them rich. Make them fat, God. As you said in your word, we declare this to be true and we honor it with our tithe and our offering. In Jesus' name, amen. God bless you for your liberality. Making war in the heavenly, tearing down principalities, setting earth in Jesus' victory. Making war, making war in the heavenly. Casting down every high thing that exalts itself against the knowledge of God. He's arising, he's arising, arising in our midst. God bless you this evening. Amen. Tonight we have a special treat for us. Our evangelist Adrian Farley is going to come and minister the word of God. Amen. Incline your ear, open your hearts to what God has to say tonight. Let's give him a hand as he comes. Good test. Praise God. Amen. Let me just get set up here because this sermon might go long, so I want to make sure I got my timer. Amen. If you have your Bibles, if you would turn with me to the book of 2 Corinthians chapter 4. 2 Corinthians chapter 4. You know, uh, here recently, uh, I've, been, I've been doing a lot of, of uh, praying and seeking God. And I began to ask a lot of questions in writing this sermon. And this sermon is something dear to my heart because, you know, a lot of times I, I began to look back at my life. And I began to, to look at things and and. And ask questions, have I changed? Why have I hit roadblocks maybe in my salvation? God, why am I not seeing what I want to see? And I began to ask all kinds of questions and, and examine myself. And I began to look at what's happening in our world today. If we could, if we could just, if you would just look at Fox News for a moment. We see that, that there is 
uh, uh, protests that are going around the entire nation over these, these deaths of, of people and, and all these things. I mean, we, we see the protests, we see the movements, and I couldn't help but notice the type of people that are attracted to these protests. There is a very certain type of people that are attracted to these type of pro protests that are going on in America. And as I began to look into it and, and, and see, there was a, a young man that was arrested uh, uh, recently, uh, and he belonged to, uh, his father had some kind of standing within his city. He was a rich kid from a rich neighborhood. And we see that these, there, are, there are a lot of people, a lot of the people, if I may, come from a place of no discipline. They come from a place where, where uh, they, they have no aspiration in life. They have no discipline. They come from broken homes. So naturally, out of a broken home, it, they're growing up with a single parent. And the single parent is trying to raise uh, these kids. And, and the result of it is lack of discipline. And I began to, to look at this. And I found some pretty interesting statistics about uh, America today. I want you to listen to this. Amen. It says one out of three men uh, in America still, one out of four women in America still. That is crazy to me. One out of three men still and one out of four women still. One out of ten people in America uh, have admitted to drug abuse. Think about this. How many times do we walk in a store like Walmart or the mall and we're passing droves of people? One out of those 10 people have a, have a problem with drug addiction, drug abuse. Listen to this. 60% of people lie during a 10-minute conversation. Listen, I'm blown away by this. We're three minutes in. Hopefully I haven't lied within those three minutes. 25% of freshmen entering high school never graduate. 25%. 40% of college students drop out. 80% of people in America are in debt. <laughs> that is crazy, 80%. Now, this is the one that, that really got me. On average, the smartphone owner unlocks his phone or her phone 150 times a day. Using smartphones for longer intervals of time changes the brain chemistry. We could see that from little kids running around Walmart screaming and yelling holding the phone in their hand. At least I've seen it and it drives me crazy. 66% <laughs> of the world's population shows signs of nomophobia. I had to look up what nomophobia is. It's from fear of losing their smartphone. 71% <laughs> of people around the world sleep with their phone next to them or on their bed within reach. Smartphones are related to depression. 75% of Americans use their mobile phones on the toilet. <laughs> Some of y'all are laughing because you've been there. 75% <laughs> the, user. listen, you can't even do your business in peace without being on your phone. That's, that's rough. There's no peace in America because of phones. 20% of people would rather go without shoes for a week than take a break from their phone. So what is 20%? Uh, add up to, that means one in 11 people in America would rather go without their shoes than take a break. They'd rather go without shoes for a week than take a break from their cell phone. These, these statistics are staggering. Like th This is just a little bit of that I found. And what it all comes down to is one simple thing that I believe that every Christian should have in their life is they should have a life of discipline and which is the title of my sermon tonight disciplines of a christian life let's read in the book of second corinthians we're going to read two separate 
uh, portions of scripture. 2 Corinthians chapter 4. We're going to start in verse 7, read through 10. It says, but we have this treasure in earth, earthen vessels that the excellence of the power may be of God and not of us. We are hard pressed on every side, yet not crushed. We are perplexed, but not in despair. We're persecuted, but not forsaken, struck down, but not destroyed, always carrying about in the body the dying of the Lord Jesus, that the life of Jesus also may be manifest in our body. And our second text is found in Acts chapter 20, verse 24. It says, But none of these things move me, nor do I count my life dear to myself, so that I may finish the race with joy and the ministry which I have received from the Lord Jesus to testify to the gospel of the grace of God. Godly disciplines for the Christian life. Tonight, as I began to do a research and I began to examine my life and I began to ask questions, God, why, is there, why, do, why do we not see breakthrough? Why are there people uh, in America that we see America is being destroyed from the inside out? We see that our generation, the generation that I grew up in, amen, the millennials, we see that they are a group of people without discipline, how do we know this? Well, all you have to do is talk to a millennial. You'll know them just like that. Because no longer do they have the discipline to give their elders respect. No longer do they have the discipline, amen, to finish a job that they're given. You want to know why unemployment is so high? Listen, let me tell you something. There was a guy that I know in Lawton, and I, I just received this story a couple weeks ago. And this guy... Uh, has a great paying job. He works at an oil field company. It's called Halliburton, one of the biggest oil companies in America. If you don't know Halliburton, Halliburton is, has, uh, they're the ones that own most of the oil fields in the ocean. Listen, th this is a massive company. It's actually, he actually works in Duncan, where uh, Pastor James Clark is. One, it's a major factory out there. What's interesting is this is one of the best paying jobs in that area. Just to kind of give you an idea, when I first moved to Lawton, they said that uh, I turned down a job making $11 an hour, and people were like freaking out at me. They're like, you turned down what? They said, that is a good paying job from around here. Halliburton starts out at $23 an hour. So, so for, for them to freak out on me turning down this job at 11, listen to what this guy did. This guy works at Halliburton. And when he heard that the government was going to give $600 um, a week to, for unemployment, he quit his job just to receive unemployment. You want me to tell you what's even more scary? This dude is 50-something years old, 55, I believe. Crazy. And I began to think about this. I said, why? Because the, the people now that we are seeing, this generation, this mindset, is a people of undisciplined minds. They are a people, amen, with undisciplined morals and standards. No longer do they want to discipline themselves in work, but they would rather go undisciplined and have whatever they want. Oh, you know, hey, it's a free check from the government. Let's just sit back and soak it in. Oh, it's a free check. Why not? And we see here that this guy, he quit his job not knowing that you have to be fired to receive unemployment. <laughs> and he never received it. And I'm bringing all this up to ask a very simple question. That could it be tonight that the breakthrough that we are looking for and the place we want to uh, end up in our salvation the breakthrough, amen, in our finances, in our marriage, in our life, could it be linked to a life of undiscipline? It's a very sobering thought. You know, I, 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 got, I got a little example here just to kind of bring it, bring it to an example. You know, I began to look at the, the, this right here, and it just, it just kind of came to me. I was just cracking up by myself. I like, I like having fun or try to. I'm not the best at cracking jokes, so we all know this. But think about this. During this virus, you know, I, I received the COVID-30, which is a 30 pounds. I, I put on weight. But listen, let me, let, me just, let me just make an example here. 
This spoon right here did not make me fat. Can I tell you that? That spoon did not. This is not the problem right here. Can I tell you that spoon right there did not. And I, I put the spoon there because, listen, everyone digs in with ice cream with a spoon. Except my sister-in-law. She digs in with a fork, which is really weird. But think about this spoon right here. If it is present in my life, is not going to make me fat. Just like this fork, I relate to lettuce. <laughs> Got to stab that lettuce. That fork is not going to make me lose that COVID-30. There is no way. There is no way. And see, this is the problem, that many people will blame the fork and the spoon for not losing weight or not putting on weight. They will blame other things instead of looking at the problem. The problem is not my spoon. The problem is the hand that takes the spoon to the mouth. That is the problem. You see, we don't begin. When we wake up, we don't say, well, you know, today. No, what happens is it's just a gradual. It's, man, it tastes so good. Oh, man, that ice cream. But we don't look at the end result. It's not the spoon's fault. He's just doing his job. That's all the spoon is doing. But you see, the real problem lies within us. The real problem is a life of undiscipline. The real problem is that we are people who are born into sin without discipline. If we can look into the very beginning of time, we see that Satan, amen, uh, as he tempted Eve, she had no discipline to resist. Yes, we know he was cunning, but think about it. No discipline. Because if there was a discipline in the life, then we would be able to say no. I want to look at areas of discipline in our lives, if we could for a moment. Have our areas of discipline dwindled throughout the years of time? Have the areas of discipline in our life begin to break apart? Listen, I have to use dieting and stuff because I, I, this is what I lived for like eight years. And it just makes, I, I'm able to make sense of it for me is that when I was working out, I was disciplined in every area when it came to fitness. I would watch what I eat. I would watch what I drink. I, if I wanted to do something, I would subtract and add in. I was very attentive to what was going on in my body. I would go work out. I had a routine. I would go to the gym in the morning. I would get off work, go to the gym afternoon, sleep, and I would eat the craziest stuff just to put on weight. Listen, I do not like Vienna sausage, but I used to get a can of Vienna sausage, eat a, a, a peanut butter and jelly sandwich, and then eat that whole can of sausage. Why? Because there's a lot of protein. Listen, we do crazy stuff to achieve these goals that we are setting. But what happened? I was a man of discipline. I was a man that said, hey, I'm going to go to the gym. But what happened? Have our disciplines in our Christian walk broken down? In our Bible reading, in our praying, in our attention span during the service. Uh, I'm going to go there now. Listen, we're going to have fun, I promise. I'm going to go there. Our attention span during service. I better put my timer back down. What about in our, our witnessing? Listen, these are areas of discipline. These are areas in our life that we have to be disciplined in. Listen, there are many people that cry out and say, oh, God, help me. I'm in a tough spot, God. Oh, I need breakthrough in this area. Oh, and when they're in the, when they're in the gutter, man, oh, then they show a life of discipline. Oh, it's then when they say, oh, here I am. You know, God, I need you to hear me. And we serve such a graceful and a merciful God that he hears us. But what happens as soon as we get our answer? Oh, we're going right back to where we were. Hey, man, I lost my 20 pounds. I guess I can start eating my donuts again. Once I get back up there, I'll lose again. Have we lost discipline in our fasting, in our witnessing, what about in our ministry, having a healthy discipline and saying, you know, you know what, if I start something, I'm going to finish it. Listen, that is one of the biggest problems in America that I've seen. And I'm just 32 years old. I worked on a coal mine with a lot of youngsters, man. 
great opportunity to make a lot of money. But let me tell you, these guys would go out there and they would work a job, but because they didn't like the hours, they would rather go work at McDonald's just to party. They couldn't discipline themselves enough and to receive the blessing. A lot of them would start something and never finish it. That was one of my pet peeves, man. Woo! And I, I learned that, unfortunately, at the Coliseum from Pastor. He would tell me, you're starting a project there, you're starting a project there, you're starting one there, 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 but you're never finishing any of them. Why? Because I was undisciplined and, un, and distracted in these areas in life. And if we could convey that to our Christian walk, amen, many times we could be a people that are undisciplined. We say, oh, God, I want breakthrough in my finances, but every night we're going out to eat and sliding that card. Oh, God, we want you to bless, bless our finances, but we're unfaithful in our tithe. Oh, Lord, I want you to move God in my finances, but we never give love offerings of gratitude for his provision that he's given us thus far. God, I want you to answer my prayers, but the only time he hears from us is when we're in need. I'm just meddling now. Undisciplined in our attitudes. Listen, I know we have tough days, but, man, we come to church because we serve a God of mercy and grace who is here to help us. And we come in with this bad attitude. What happened to discipline and say, you know what? Let's put the world behind us and let's come into the house of the Lord to worship God and see our brothers and sisters who are yet fighting. I believe that we all have the same goal in this place tonight, which is to make heaven our home. And I'm preaching this because a life without discipline will never receive breakthrough, amen. A life without discipline, amen, will always be a struggle to overcome opposition in our life. This is something that is vital to the Christian life, to live a life of discipline and separation from the world. How we speak about others takes a discipline. Because we're people who like, to, who like the cheese mess. We're ear hustlers. We like hearing all the dirt on everybody, then we go and speak to everybody else. It takes discipline to cut those things off. It takes discipline to speak words that are helpful instead of words that are hurtful. Why? Because we are combating one of the enemies that we face in this world is the enemy of our flesh. Judging rebellion, how we treat others, what we listen to. Listen, I remember growing up and hearing sermons on, hey, man, what are you listening to in your car? I'll never forget my mom grabbed on my CDs one time and threw them all in the trash. I don't know if she remembers that. But there was a sermon. She, she got convicted. She said, what are you guys listening to? And we had all kinds of stuff. She went and grabbed them all and threw them in the trash. And I remember freaking out. Why? But she established something in our lives. That we better be careful what we listen to, what we look at, how we treat others. As we begin to look in the Word of God, we see that there are men in the Word of God that, that could help us. In Daniel chapter 6, 10 through 11, it says, Now Daniel knew that they were, uh, they were writing was signed when he went home. They're, they're setting up Daniel. And it says... And in his upper room, with his windows open towards Jerusalem, he knelt down on his knees three times that day and prayed and gave thanks before God, as was his custom in those days. I want you to think about this for a moment. It says that these men were setting out a decree, and it was against Daniel's life. And as he heard this, he immediately goes to his room, and it says that three times a day he gets down on his knees and prays. If we read on in the, in the scripture, it says, as was his custom. As I began to look into what this me meant, amen, as was his custom. What it is talking about, it says, as was his custom or his lifestyle, his life of discipline that he established from long ago, amen. He was there from the very beginning praying to God each and every day, three times a day, as was his custom, as was his uh, uh, I, don't, I don't know how to say anything else on that, but, but think about it. He established a life of discipline, of prayer. And we see that as he went in the lion's den, because it was a part of him, because he was a man of discipline, he received a great miracle of breakthrough. 
Custom means a way of behaving or a belief that has been established for a long time. Amen. When we get saved, amen, we have customs from the past in our lives, but they're broken at the altar. And it is here where we have to uh, develop new disciplines in our Christian walk. Listen, the goal for each and every one of us here tonight is to make heaven our home. But listen, it'll be a struggle if we have no discipline of righteous intake of the Word of God. It'll be a struggle if we don't cry out to our God. And it, only in times of need do we cry out. I'm talking about establishing, amen, a custom in your life tonight. We hear the preaching of, of the Word of God three times a week. But do we have the discipline to apply it and self-examine? Romans 6, 6 says, Knowing this, that our old man was crucified with him, that the body of sin might be done away with, that we should no longer be slaves to sin. Some of us are still slaves to our old habits. We say, God, why haven't I overcome this? I've been saved for so many years. God, why haven't I overcome? Could it be that you haven't established a life of discipline in certain areas? Lord, why, why, why can I overcome these areas in my, in my finances or in my ministry? Have you lost discipline? There are three enemies that you and I face on the regular. The world, the flesh, and the devil. We must cut off, amen, the world in our lives. There are areas that we all, listen, it's like this, this spoon here. There are areas, man, in, our, <laughs> in my diet life, I said, God, why am I not losing? It's because of those bag of chips at midnight that I be t touching. It's because of those cookies that are left on the counter that my wife has. Listen, I can't help it. But if we take this and look at our spiritual life and we think about this for a moment, why are we not where we're supposed to be? Could it be these little things that we're dabbling with in our life that we have yet to cut off? The Bible says to resist the devil and he will flee. Have we stopped resisting? You see, this takes discipline. Each and every day it takes discipline to resist the devil. Because as soon as we stop resisting, we've given in. Can I tell you, quitting is only a temporary relief. But it has long-term consequences. You see, we have to crucify the flesh. As we read our text, amen, tonight, it says, But we have this treasure in earthen vessels, that the excellence of the power may be of God and not of us. We are hard-pressed on every side, yet not crushed. We're hard-pressed. I want you to think about this. When something is being pressed, amen, if we're not crushed, then there has to be a resistance. It's going to take work to establish a discipline, amen. I, when you, you do anything in life, it's going to establish a discipline. Whether you go to work, it says, hey, be here at 9 o'clock. You better be there at 9 o'clock. It's a discipline in life. As I began to examine these things in life and began to question God, I said, God, I want to be closer to you, Lord. I want to know you more. That it's going to require more. One of the funniest things that I heard in, in weightlifting is, you know, everybody wants a six-pack. Everybody does. But they don't want to put in the work for it. People don't understand. That's some hard work. So you know what the you know what guys are doing now? They're going to they're getting implants in their stomach to look like to look like a six pack. That's ridiculous. They're getting calf implants with their little chicken legs. Why? Because they don't, they are undisciplined men that want immediate gratification. Listen, that's what an undisciplined life is. It's wanting immediate gratification, amen, with no discipline. It goes on to say. Not yet crushed. We are perplexed, but not in despair. We are persecuted, but not forsaken. God is always there. Struck down, but we're never destroyed. Always caring uh, about in the body of the dying of the Lord Jesus Christ, that in the life of Jesus may also be manifest in our body. We, we read this text and we see that as Jesus went to the cross, 
It says that we carry the Lord Jesus. The life of Jesus may be manifested within us. Can I tell you whether you're disciplined or undisciplined, it'll be manifested in the flesh? Just like that spoon. Undisciplined with the spoon, it's showing. Right? Listen. But it says carrying that the life of Jesus may also be manifest in our body. Meaning that the, the life of discipline, he was set apart from the world. He was a man of discipline. It says that he went and he prayed. And we see that his life was all consumed with the restoration of mankind. He had one thing in mind. And his life was disciplined until the very end where he went to the cross and he gave his life and he rose again. He conquered. I want to look at the benefits real quickly of a life of discipline. You know, one of the things that I, that, uh, I was studying, uh, actually me and uh, uh, Pastor Aaron were talking about it, that every, ma every millionaire, every billionaire, though they have a life of, of luxury, they have all the money in the world, they all have something in common, that they're all disciplined. They read every day. They're advocate readers. They have a healthy workout regimen. They stay busy. They keep their mind going. They don't just relax and, and take in all the money. No, they, they are active. One of the, the, the things that I studied out on is that we see that there are men who have won, uh, uh, what is it called, the lottery or the scratchers, I don't know. They've won millions of dollars, and within a year they blow it. Why? Because they're living a life of undiscipline, and then they get all this money, and they don't change their life. They don't think about their future, and they go on, and they blow something that could be potentially the greatest blessing in their life. Now, I'm not saying go get a scratcher. <laughs> but think about it. They blow their, 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 that, this money because they're undisciplined on crazy stuff. One, one guy uh, blew all his money on eating out. All he wanted to do was eat and, and, and take cocaine. And that's all he did. Blew his money within one year. He won 2.7 million. But let's look at the benefits of a life of discipline for the Christian life. Self-discipline means self-control and the ability to avoid unhealthy excess of anything that could lead to negative consequences for your life. Think about that. The ability to reject instant gratification and pleasure in favor of a greater gain, which requires spending effort and time to get it. A life of discipline avoids instant gratification. That's what a, that's what a lot of guys do nowadays. They want instant gratification without the work. It means perseverance and not giving up. It's the strength not to give in to negative feelings. It means overcoming one's weaknesses. It, it is the ability to pursue one's plans despite of temptations to abandon them. We are all surrounded by temptations. It means to push them aside despite of what the temptations are to follow the vision that we have. You see, this is one of the, the, the blessings it is as a Christian of living a life of discipline, is that we are able to pursue all that God has for us, steadfastly resisting what is aside for the end result of being a Christian that is steady, steadfast, and eventually to make heaven our home. Discipline avoids acting out rationally or on impulse. That's a big one. Many people get all mad and they just leave church right away for no reason. Because they, they, they're undisciplined. But with a life of discipline, they fulfill promises that they make to themselves and to others. They're faithful. They make wise and healthy choices, overcome laziness and procrastination. They continue working on a project even after uh, all the struggles and trials of that project have faded away or the enthusiasm for it. They continue on to see it completed. Listen, there are many benefits, but I want to look, last of all, benefits for the Christian life. There's spiritual discipline and prayer, as I said already, but Bible intake and worship, 
When we come and we, we discipline our lives in worship to God, amen, there is a, a, a contending for the presence of God. It is in those moments where we pray and we contend. It is the, pers the persistent Christian, amen, that begins to see breakthrough in their life because they're steady and steadfast and they're disciplined in what they want to receive from God. Some of us have unsaved family members, or all of us do. And we say, oh, God, I want to see them saved, but how often do you pray for them? Are you persistent and disciplined enough to say, I am going to contend for them day in and day out? Oh, God, I want to know you more, but do you read your Bible every day? God, I want to see my coworkers saved, but do you evangelize? Lord, how do I bring my flesh under subjection? Do you fast? You see, these are all things that I believe we all need to work on in life for the longevity as we read in Acts chapter 20 in closing. None of these things move me, nor do I count my life dear to myself so that I may finish the race with joy. And the ministry which I receive from the Lord Jesus to testify to the gospel of the grace of God, that I may finish the race. A life of discipline will help you finish the race tonight. A life of discipline will help you with the longevity of your salvation. Should trials come, listen, this is what boxers train for. They train hard and they discipline their life and they discipline their moves and their fighting. Why? Because when a trial comes, when someone swings at them, their reflex is to keep on fighting, not flying. <laughs> Why? Because their life has been disciplined for the very moment that they step into that ring. When the Christian life is disciplined, amen, it is for the very moments, amen, when you are in your strongest trial, in the deepest fire, amen, where you can't see God and you don't know where to go. It is in your moment where you are in the most uh, painful thing that you're going through where God will bring direction because you are keeping your relationship with him. It is a life of discipline set apart to where God could trust you. And he's, you say, God, here I am. And he knows that he could trust you. He says, why? Because he looks down at his servant and says, you know what? I could tell because he is a man of discipline. If we could think of discipline as this, we know the story of Zacchaeus. He's a man of great stature about this big. He's wanting to see Jesus, and so what does he do? He runs to a sycamore tree, and he climbs up, and he's there, and he gets in the path of Jesus, and Jesus is walking, and he sees him. Can I tell you, when you discipline your life in godly principles and in these areas, you are putting yourself in the path of God and saying, Lord, look at my giving, God. Consider my giving tonight. Lord, I have disciplined myself. I have consistently been here through every trial. Lord, hear my cry. It is in these moments where discipline puts us, amen, in the path of Jesus, and he's able to look down and say, my daughter, my son, I don't know about you, but when someone tells me, hey, man, I'll be there, and they never show up, it doesn't hold very much weight. Oh, God, I'll do it, God. I'm here. Whatever you need, I got you. Then you call them. They don't answer. Oh, brother, I didn't even know you called. Can't trust them. Could this be what the Word of God is showing you and I to finish the race? living a life set apart from God, living a life of discipline, that God will say, you know what, you have been faithful in your tithe. Not only have you been faithful and disciplined in your spending and being a good steward, but now I could trust you with more. Oh, you have been set apart in your life. You have uh, pushed the things of the world away. Now it is my time to call you into the ministry. You have been disciplined and fervently praying to me. I have heard your cry, and I will move on your behalf. A life that is set apart and disciplined has a major lasting effect. I wonder tonight if we can consider our lives for a moment and stop blaming everyone else, start looking at ourselves. Because, listen, I could blame this fork and spoon all day. But the only one who could change what those things put in this mouth is me. 
And as I began to write this sermon and began to ask God, I said, God, I want to be closer to you. And he began to speak to me. He said, then you've got to learn discipline. And I began to examine my life, and I began to look. I said, God, have I been a man of discipline? And this is where the story came. And I began, I began to read all these things about what's going on in the world. And it all leads to undisciplined people. Because, listen, our sinful nature wants instant gratification. That's what we want. That's why they go from smoking a joint to snorting a line. Because the gratification slowly loses. Slowly fades away. And I believe tonight, I pray that this helps each and every one of you. Because, listen, there are areas in our life that have broken down those disciplines. And God is calling us back for such a time. We've we've heard uh, time and time again, oh, God is going to bring man and we're going to see revival. Oh, but if we are not a church that is disciplined enough to be an example to to this world that is dying, then those that come in are going to fall right into that same path and be undisciplined as us. Listen, I'm, I'm preaching myself tonight. Are we putting ourselves in the path where God says, I could trust you with people. I could trust you with couples. I could trust you with finances. Listen, many of us in here have been here for a long time. I see Brother Joe always coming. Every time I see him lifting his hands in worship, amen, I'm not saying this just because he's here, but I, 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 I see him lifting his hands in worship. I said, man, a man of discipline in worship. Brother David and Sister Stacy. Man, I said, these people, I said, God, what is it? And they have lived a life of discipline. And they have consecrated themselves. Listen, we're, none of us are perfect. But what we all could do is work on our discipline. You know, we see some kids, amen, nowadays in high school, and they never finish. Why? Because of lack of discipline. They don't focus anymore. And it's, we say, oh, they're kids. But can I tell you, it's bled over into <laughs> two adults. It's crazy. Many guys don't grow up nowadays until they're 40 and 50 years old. Why? Because they never established discipline in their life. And tonight, church, have we lost the discipline that we once had? I believe tonight, for the longevity of our salvation, for the hope for our unsafe families and friends to receive the prize, to finish the race, for the consistency of the gospel to be spread. Tonight, I think every one of us want to make heaven our home. I can't help but think about Pastor Cluck and Pastor Mitchell. Lives of discipline, and now they're home. They receive their prize. Listen, I want to join them. But what it's going to take for you and I is to establish that discipline once again. Let's bow our heads tonight and close our eyes in reverence to God. Maybe you find yourself tonight living a life of undisciplined. You say, you know what, I just, I just take in the world as it comes. Listen, we've all been there. We've all lived a life just for every moment for instant gratification. But tonight... God is speaking to you and saying, you know what? I want to give you purpose back in your life. He wants to bring a restoring from those years that you have just, uh, just let go and, and partook of the world. Listen, the Bible says that sin will take us to hell. It separates us from God. And tonight, if you're not saved, I want to pray with you tonight. If you're not saved, I just want you to lift your hand and say, Pastor, pray for me. All across this place. So we're a body of believers. I know that. I understand that. But listen, you know the areas in your life. Oh, in the times where you are alone, when you're on the job, when no one else sees. Maybe you're living a life of sin. And you're, 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 there's areas in your life that you know is not right. Listen, we want to see you make heaven your home. Tonight, lift your hand. Backslider, that's you. I don't care if you're visiting for the first time or you've been here your entire life. Lift your hand all across this place. Come back to God. Listen, God wants to help you. He wants to set you free. 
Praise God. I want to change the order of this service tonight. Maybe God has spoken to you. If we could examine our lives for just a, a moment and look deep inside and say, and be honest with ourselves. Have I been consistent in my ministry? Have I been consistent in my giving? You do, you fill in the blank. God, have I came in to the, your house of worship and been distracted during the song service and not giving you all that I am? God, have I been distracted in my ministry? Lord, have I been distracted and neglecting what you have called me to do? Maybe God has dealt with you tonight as our text says tonight. That God will not forsake us. And the ministry which I received from the Lord Jesus to testify of the grace of God. Are you taking care of your ministry tonight? Are you taking care of your salvation? Are you disciplining yourself in your salvation, in your daily intake, in what you're listening to, and what you're speaking out? Are you disciplining your life in the things that you are sharing with your brothers and sisters? Are you disciplining yourself in your prayer life, in your worship? Listen, we could all take a moment and look at ourselves and say, you know what? There are areas that have faded away, and tonight, I want to make a call to you tonight. Maybe God has spoken to you and say, you, you say, you know what? There are areas, and I need to make them right. I want us to all stand in this place. We're going to open up these altars. I want you to come find a place to pray and let God help you tonight. You want to be closer to God. You want to see breakthrough. Amen. Tonight, you can receive breakthrough. But it's going to take a life of discipline. Hallelujah. Purify my heart. Let me be oh as God, gold. I worship you, God. I praise you, Lord. says in first timothy chapter 4 7 it says but reject profane and old wife fables and exercise yourself towards godliness this word exercise also means to discipline yourself towards godliness i believe listen i want to see each and every one of you in heaven and your families and tonight the only way we're going to receive the prize and we make heaven our home and be steadfast and finish the race is if we exercise discipline 
in our lives. Amen. That's all I have. Let's give God praises. Pastor Eric. Fire. My heart's one desire is to be tonight. Go apply that to your life this evening. Praise God. We're going to go ahead and close tonight. Remember the concert this Saturday at the venue. Uh, amen. Go support that wonderful ministry. We're going to go ahead and close. Brother David, would you close us tonight? Amen. God bless you tonight. Have a wonderful evening.